We all rely on farmers and ranchers, but farming is riskier than other businesses out there. Crop insurance helps farmers manage their risk. With crop insurance, farmers put skin in the game by paying premiums and shouldering deductibles. That keeps taxpayers from having to pick up the whole bill every time disaster strikes. Today, about 90% of U.S. farmland is insured, providing $100 billion in protection to more than 130 different kinds of crops. It's a testament to the program's success. Thank you for joining us for our AgriPulse Washington Week interview. I'm Spencer Chase, joined as always by AgriPulse Executive Editor Philip Rasher, as well as this week by Arkansas Republican John Bozeman and Senator Bozeman. We appreciate you joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, as always. Uh, for starters, obviously, we need, we need to talk about the big agenda item on Capitol Hill, uh, that, of course, being uh, efforts on the part of uh, Democratic leaders in Congress to pass a uh, reconciliation package. We used to say a $3.5 trillion reconciliation package. It does appear that that number is going to be trimmed. Uh, to what end is, is yet to be determined. And uh, Senator Bozeman, I know you've expressed your frustrations to, to us and to others about sort of the lack of input that you and your fellow Republicans have had on this process, but you're still one of uh, 100 senators. You've probably got a better view of the process than uh, than most of the rest of America. Uh, wondering fr- from the chair you're sitting in, how, how is this process unfolding? Uh, how how what is just kind of your assessment, your take on the situation as, as Democrats seek to pass this legislation? Well, to be honest, I think the process has been terrible. Uh, we can be very proud that the Agriculture Committee traditionally has been very nonpartisan. Uh, you work hard, you visit with the regions of the country. The South has certain issues, California, uh, the Great Plains, the eyes. You put all of that together. And then also by commodities. Uh, cotton is very different than corn and rice and soybeans, and the list goes on and on. And then you talk to the stakeholders. You work hard, but now we're in a situation where we're spending many, many billions of dollars without any input from the Senate Ag Committee at all uh, on the Republican side. And I would say probably very little from the Democratic side. This, most of this is coming from the White House. And so I'm really disappointed. The other problem too is that as you start spending these, these amounts of money, all kinds of issues come up. That's why the process is so important, is flushing out the unintended consequences. As you have hearings, as you discuss, we're gonna start having hearings, I assume, you know, fairly soon regarding the next farm bill. We do that so we can get, you know, again, the unintended consequences, flushing out what we need to do. But this process is terrible. And, and as a result, I think that's one of the reasons that they're struggling the way they are. The bill itself is bad. The pay fors are even worse. This bill uh, in some kind, it's Democrats seem to tend on passing it. It's a very high priority for the president. Um, do you, and it's going to have some amount of uh, funding for agriculture and conservation programs in it, if it does. Uh, 20, there's $28 billion for conservation and what the House has uh, pending now. When you go to write the next farm bill, and you could be chairman, um, if not uh, the ranking Republican on the committee, um, would you feel bound to spend the money the way it is directed in, in this bill? No, I think that's a real problem. Uh, one of the things that we've always said, and we've done a very, very good job of this in the past, is we've said we're not opening the farm bill. This is a five-year commitment to farmers. A few years ago, they tried to derate it for, the, for transportation dollars. So it's a huge amount of money sitting there. And again, other areas look at it. So always the Senate Ag Committee and the, uh, uh, and the House Ag Committee have stood together. Democrats and Republicans have said no. Now all of a sudden we, we have the, the bill in place now and you have people coming in and just arbitrarily trying, changing it. So my concern, my real concern is the Senate, the House, Congress is a creature of precedent. If you can do that this time, my concern is we pass another, you know, Senate ag bill. And then a year or two years later, you just go in and and the administration, whoever that administration is, Democrat or Republican, comes in and then arbitrarily changes based on their priorities. That's not a good situation. So would you move money around uh, out of uh, 
this a lot of this is going to be earmarked for conservation research. Uh, do you think it should be moved to other I think areas if you get that opportunity? I think a lot of it is just parked there. When you look at it, I don't really understand it because we haven't had the hearings. It's constantly changing. You know, nobody's asking me, you know, why $28 billion? Why not $14 billion? Originally, they started at $50 billion. So I don't, I don't understand it. So I, I can't really tell you, uh, you know, exactly if I'm for it or against it, because I don't know where it's at. Nobody does. And that's a real problem. Like I say, it's not just me. It's you. you nobody's more active than you all are as far as getting out and interviewing people. Nobody understands it. It's no stakeholder. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. So we're going to do, after visiting with the regions, after visiting with the commodities, after visiting with all of the stakeholders, we're going to do what, what we come to a consensus is best for farmers. You know, that may or may not be the same thing that's in there now, but I certainly won't feel bound, you know, by a situation that no Republican, no stakeholders had anything to do with. This is coming out of the administration. Uh, the chairman, your counterpart, or the, the chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, uh, David Scott, said today that uh, he would commit to working on possibly making the a Title I permanent law. Of course, uh, the way it stands now, you have to do a farm bill every uh, five or six years because if you don't, it kicks, uh, the 1949 law kicks in and the possibility of big increases in dairy prices. It's been a strong um, impetus to get to. Uh, farm bill done every few years. What, what do you think about the idea of making the commodity title permanent? Well, I have a lot of respect for Congressman Scott. I had the opportunity to serve with him for many years. He and I were both very active on the NATO parliament. And so I've traveled with him extensively. He's a good friend. Uh, I don't, again, you know, I'd have to discuss that, but at first blush, and, and I've thought about that somewhat. I, I I would not be for that, you know, right now. I think it's important that we do do the five-year program, you know, for all kinds of reasons. You know, I think the look back is good. And certainly with agriculture, we've seen how it can change dramatically within a year or two, depending on commodity prices, depending on world, where the world is at, because it is so important regarding our exports. In Arkansas, 40% of our, our products are exported. I would say that's probably true, you know, across the board. So that is constantly in flux. So uh, I, I would be prone to say, no, I think the program that we worked, uh, you know, so far is working and certainly, you know, needs to be tweaked. Maybe sometimes needs to be changed significantly, but more or less tweaked. So I, I, I don't think that would be. Senator, I want to wrap things up today uh, with a conversation around a piece of legislation that was dropped earlier this week in the House, and it follows a number of other uh, bills that were dropped uh, over the last couple of years after a series of uh, so-called black swan events in the cattle industry. Uh, we saw earlier this week uh, Congressman Johnson from South Dakota introduce legislation to create a contract library uh, within in the House of Representatives. We've seen similar legislation in the Senate, but we also have this looming deadline at the end of the year. Uh, maybe even a little bit before then on the reauthorization of livestock mandatory reporting. Wondering uh, if you could, uh, you know, to put on your prognostication hat for us and kind of crystal ball how, how this process uh, goes, uh, looks going forward. Do you think there's the possibility to add additional items onto LMR reauthorization, or is this going to be a process that's going to lead to a, a clean reauthorization with potential policy making down the road? Well, livestock reporting uh, is such an important thing to, to get done. What we learned was that if you let this lapse, then USDA has to do a bunch of rulemaking things and, and it might become a situation where it takes a lot of time. We, we don't want that to happen. So I, I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm, I'd like to talk to Dusty about his bill. The things that, that I've heard from, and I used to have a bunch of cows and and, uh, you know, I, I really am very familiar with this. Uh, but the things I've learned, uh, areas of agreement are uh, increased transparency, which, you know, is what he's trying to get with this. Uh, and then also uh, trying to get, uh, you know, more people uh, slaughtering cattle, cattle in the sense of getting, uh, you know, that rectified. So 
Um, USDA, Secretary Vilsack is doing, I think, a, you know, a, a better job of trying to push some dollars in that direction uh, regarding uh, increased competition. And then again, the transparency piece. So I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I don't know if we have time to, uh, you know, to actually get some things vetted and, and going forward. I don't know what the, when you look at the calendar right now, there's not a lot of time. Okay. So, but I'm very open to, to trying to solve these problems. It's something that the good news is a lot of uh, attention is being paid to it. And, uh, but we do want to continue the, the, even if we have to have another CR to buy us a little bit more time as we work through some of these problems. So here okay. we sit the 21st day of October, uh, <laughs> wrapping things up uh, almost, it seems like uh, in the, the grand scheme of the legislative calendar, the end of the year, a lot closer uh, than some folks may realize. And it's going to be a very busy, uh, you know, a two and a half months here in Washington, D.C. And uh, Senator Bozen, we appreciate your time to uh, help us make a little sense of it all. Well, I appreciate that. I guess my concern is, is that, you know, talking about this issue uh, livestock marketing, you know, things like that. Uh, the things I hear about are labor, the supply chain. Those are the things we need to be concentrating on right now, rather than cradle to grave, massive spending bill, uh, which is terrible policy. And then the pay fors I think we've pretty much done a good job of eliminating the, uh, the agriculture community to said no to the stepped up basis. I think our Texas A&M study had a lot to do with that. Now we're facing this $600 or $10,000, you know, then, then we get to look at your checkbook situation. So lots going on. Uh, there's not much time left, but I, I suspect there'll be a lot of drama between now and the first of the year. And thank you guys so much for the great job you do of just reporting and things that are going on. Well, I think that'll do it for today. So for Senator John Bozeman and Phil Brasher, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one.